Hello everyone. Today we have a very important topic that is recklessness. As we have studied the term intention, as you know, the recklessness is having less culpability than the intention and more culpability than the negligence. As in our previous lecture, we have studied this particular thing. And you also know that uh, for intention, three things has to be proved. Number one. Foresightness of consequence. Number two, follow the course of conduct. And number three, desire of consequence. So, for intention, three things has to be proved. The accused is having a desire to commit an offence. Number two, for that desire, he followed the course of conduct. And while following the course of conduct, he is having foresightness of the consequence. If these, these three things are existing, then we can say the accused is having an intention to commit an offence. But suppose the desire is missing or the foresightness is missing, then what we call it, whether the accused can be punished or not. So for that end, we must jump over the term called recklessness. In case of recklessness, the desire is missing. The foresightness is present, but the desire is missing. As uh, we have uh, already studied and uh, I have given you an example. Suppose a doctor is operating over the patient and he is knowing that what would be the consequence because the patient is in critical condition. If he is not operating over the patient, then definitely the patient would die. And therefore, uh, as a reasonable man, therefore, to... Uh, respect his profession he is operating over the patient and if suppose the patient is died in that situation he don't have desire to commit the offense of murder rather he was having a desire to save his life so in such a situation the doctor cannot be punished for the offense of culpable homicide the reason was the desire was missing only foresightness of foresightness was present that what would be the consequence of his act. Similarly, suppose a person is moving his car at the speed of 80 km per hour in a busy area and if suppose if he hits someone then in such a situation that the person will not be responsible for, uh, for intention. Rather, he will be in, re responsible for the recklessness because in such moving the desire was absent rather foresightness was present and the course of conduct was present so in such a situation the doctor uh, the rider or the uh, the driver shall not be responsible for intention rather for the recklessness so in case of doctor example he is operating over the patient what does it mean the act was done on the part of the accused so in such a situation the act was done now the question is whether the act was done for himself or for the society as uh, we have already discussed in our previous lecture someone is, uh, just stopped uh, or switch off his van as the crossing and to save the petrol and while switching off the van it got exploded so it was again a recklessness but the act was done for himself and not for and not for the society whereas the doctor is operating over the patient again the doctor is doing an act and he could foresee the consequence but that act was done for the society and not for himself so basically what happens in recklessness the person is taking the risk he know the consequence but the but the desire is missing he don't want to commit the offense but actually the offense is being committed by the person so the act was done but he is taking the risk and that risk taking was unreasonable we must go into uh, the debate that whether the risk taking was reasonable risk taking or the unreasonable risk taking the doctor is taking a reasonable risk the man switching off his van is taking a reasonable risk but of course one is for himself and other one for the society but if the person is taking the risk and that risk is unreasonable, then definitely the person will be responsible for the offense committee. 
so therefore we must examine the person is whether the person is taking the risk or not now come to a very important aspect of recklessness that actually we have understood that what we call recklessness but the recklessness is divided into two parts number one the subjective recklessness and number two the objective recklessness subjective recklessness we would study with the help of the case called r versus cunningham decided in the year 1957 by the twin bench division whereas objective recklessness we would study with the help of r versus cardwell it was decided in the year 1982 by the house of lord so in the present scenario which recklessness is prevailing and which recklessness is having more weightage or uh, we would study later that which recklessness have was overruled by the house of lord so let us pick up the case called r versus cunningham in this case what happened the accused removed the gas pipeline and the meter to steal the money inside it so what happened as a result uh, the gas escaped the gas leaked from the pipe and thereby he puts life of other person in danger now while putting the life of other person in danger he was prosecuted under section 23 of the offences against the persons act 1861 that says whoever endangers the life of other human being then he shall be prosecuted and punished so while prosecuting and punishing the accused the court applied the subjective test of recklessness now the question is what we called subjective recklessness as we know the recklessness has been divided into two parts subjective recklessness and the objective recklessness so malice must be taken as requiring either an actual intention to do the particular kind of crime that in fact was then what does it mean the what was the intention of the accused while doing the particular kind of crime and the number 2 the recklessness as to whether such harm should occur or not what does it mean whether accused could have foreseen the particular kind of harm or not so there is foresightness of consequence and number 2 that what was the intention of the accused at that point of time these two things has to be taken into consideration while making the accused responsible so in case of subjective recklessness we must take into consideration that actually accused what was thinking at that point of time whether he was thinking to commit the crime whether he was thinking to do an act which endangers the human life or any other thing there is a term called malice in case of malice the accused is aware of the consequence and where the accused is aware of the consequence and ignored that consequence in such a situation we can say the accused did the act with the malicious intention and therefore there is recklessness it was well within the ambit of the accused knowledge and therefore it was done recklessly and it is called subjective recklessness or suppose the accused was in hurry and while in hurry he did an act was the commission of the crime it is also called the subjective recklessness because the consequence was well within the knowledge of the accused let us take an, another example suppose three four person went over the petrol pump and one of them started smoking whether he can claim that he was not knowing that by smoking at the petrol pump there cannot be an explosion whether he can take this defense obviously not we can say it was well within the knowledge of the accused that while smoking at the petrol pump there might be an explosion and he may put other persons life into danger so that this is all about the subjective recklessness 
what we understood that in case of subjective, subjective recklessness or all things are well within the knowledge of the accused and while projecting himself uh, into the future he could foresee the consequence and while foreseeing the consequence still he put other person's life into danger and thereby it is called a subjective recklessness although it cannot be verified by the external source of information because it is less than intention so the ultimately the court concluded that if the person could not foresee the consequence he cannot be held responsible for the offense of putting the life of life into danger of other people now come to another aspect of recklessness that is objective recklessness and that was decided in the case of r versus cardwell in the year 1982 now come to a very important aspect of recklessness that is objective recklessness as decided in the year 1982 in the case of r versus cardwell in this case what happened uh, there was a person called cardwell he was a former hotel employee and one day he was got fired by his employer uh, or boss uh, on the basis that he was drunk on one night in the year 1979 and what happened after firing after got fired by his boss he decided to teach him a lesson and thereby he set on fire to his former employer's hotel intending to damage the property so at the time of fire there were guests inside of the hotel room though the fire extinguished quickly and the cardwell not only charged for the arson under criminal damage of property act arson here means maliciously burning or destroying the property and also he was charged for the arson with intent to endanger the human life what happened he pleaded guilty for the arson he pleaded guilty for the arson but for second offense that putting in danger the human life he pleaded not guilty there is a section in the criminal damage of property act section 1 clause 2 which says a person who without lawful excuse damages any property belonging to another intending to damage any such property or being reckless as to whether any such property would be damaged shall be guilty of an offence so for this he pleaded guilty but for second intending by damage to endanger the life of another under this particular clause he didn't pleaded guilty what it says intending by the damage to the uh, to endanger the life of another or being reckless as to whether the life of another would be thereby in danger so the house of lord convicted him under section 1 clause 2 of the uh, offences under damage of property act he was convicted for the both uh, for both the offences arson where uh, where he uh, destroyed or damaged the property and while destroying the property he endangered the life of, uh, of other uh, for which he pleaded not guilty but the court rejected his argument and uh, his defense was and he argued before the court i was so drunk that i could not foresee the consequence his defense was that uh, i was so drunk and therefore i could not foresee the consequence and therefore i shall not be prosecuted for the second offense but the court of law rejected his all the arguments and convicted him on the basis of reasonable man test now the question is what we call the reasonable man test in case of reasonable man uh, test what happens what a reasonable man would do at that point of time whether reasonable man could not foresee the consequence whether uh, suppose if the reasonable man was there and if suppose he is putting on fire the hotel whether he could not foresee the consequence that some other people some guests were inside or would be inside and definitely he, he is going to put the other person's life into danger by his own act 
so the court of law convicted him on the reasonable man test and not the objective test reasonable man test is uh, uh, sorry uh, on the reasonable man test and not the subjective test reasonable man test is also called as objective test so what we understood that uh, cunningham case is for the subjective test and cordwell test is for the objective test and it is also called a reasonable man test but ultimately this reasonable man test or the objective test was overruled in r versus g in the year 2003 by the house of lords itself so come to uh, the reasonable man test was overruled uh, in the year 2003 by the house of lords in the case of r versus g and the court jump over the subjective test as decided in r versus cunningham so what happened in case of r versus g there were two boys of 11 years and 12 years of age they went on the road in the early morning and what happened they saw a factory they were feeling cold in the early morning and they decided to feel some warmth and they find out some rubbish paper uh, and they put on fire the paper and plastic in the backyard of the company and what happened the fire spread and very soon it uh, spreaded over the rooftop of the factory and it causes damage of 1 million property so what happened they uh, uh, they were prosecuted before the court of law for the uh, 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 for an offense under the damage of property act they pleaded not guilty on the ground that uh, accused were unaware about the consequences just because of their age they are unable to understand the consequences they, uh, they were only thinking to put on fire so that they may feel warm and what happened the court was in confusion to bring back the test to the subjective standard so that defendants can be judged on the basis of their age their experience and understanding rather than on the standard of hypothetical reasonable man test who might have better knowledge and understanding since uh, just because of their age uh, they could not foresee the consequence if we will put uh, the court thought if we will put the reasonable man test here then definitely these two boys would be punished for the offenses for putting uh, for damaging the property and ultimately the court applied the subjective test and overruled r versus cardwell the objective test so this was decided in the year 2013 and the court overruled the objective test now come to another important aspect of the uh, intention and that is the negligence in case of negligence there is duty to take care and if the person is not taking care of his duty then definitely he is omitting his duty and he is causing uh, some act he is doing some act and that act is not good or wrongful act in the eyes of law for example if a person riding his bike over the road then he is having duty to take care and if he is omitting the duty and if any accident occur then definitely the biker will be responsible so in case of uh, negligence the person is unaware of consequence just because he is omitting his duty so what we understood that uh, in case of intention there is desire of consequence the person followed the course of conduct and uh, uh, while following the course of conduct he could foresee the consequence in case of uh, uh, ne- uh, recklessness the the desire is missing he followed the course of conduct and co- he could foresee the consequence but in case of negligence the desire is missing as well as foresight is missing but he followed the course of conduct so in cordwell uh the person is stopped while going to do an act he is stopped and he is thinking he is going to apply his mind and while applying the mind mind he know the consequence possibly the two reason may arise that uh, the two condition may arise that he know the consequence or he does not know 
the consequence if he could know the consequence and is still uh, going towards the commission of the crime then he shall be responsible but if he could not uh, even application after application of mind if he could not foresee the consequence then he shall not be responsible but suppose he didn't stopped he didn't applied his mind and therefore don't know the consequence in such a situation he shall be responsible now i am going to repeat it that in case of cardwell case the person has to apply his mind if after application of his mind he could foresee the consequence and he stopped there and not going further then in such a situation no offense has been committed on the part of the accused and if he applied his mind and he could not foresee the consequence and did the act then he shall not be responsible point number 2 he didn't stop he didn't applied his mind and therefore just because of non application of his mind he couldn't foresee the consequence then in such a situation he shall be responsible so what happens in recklessness he consciously taking an unreasonable risk then only he shall be responsible if it was a reasonable risk a reasonable risk means the doctor example that uh, the the person was saving the life because he, he was consciously taking the risk but that risk taking was for the society and not for himself and that for the good that for the goodness and he is aware that he is taking the risk but in case of negligence he inadvertently taking unreasonable risk and therefore he is unaware of its consequence and what we say that he ought to know the consequence or he ought to have aware of the consequence and uh, this is called the negligence in case of negligence the desire is missing the foresightness of consequence is missing the only uh, and only the act towards the commission of crime is present so what we understood in conclusion in uh, the negligence is having less culpability than the recklessness and the recklessness is having less culpability than the intention or we can say conversely we can say the recklessness is having more culpability than the negligence and less culpable uh, and less culpability than the intention this is all about the recklessness intention and the negligence hope you might have understood thank you thank you very much